you talk about how how communities have been weaponized against anyone that was involved in the six, whether you were inside, outside, it's almost like the government didn't need, they had, they had communities do their bidding by putting out a witch hunt, by having uh, billboards and banners up in, in the weeks following the six, you know, basically getting neighbors to rat on neighbors. Yeah. Uh, and I noticed just in my small, like comedy community, which meaning essentially high school, you know, but, what I, I definitely had like a witch hunt out for me after the six, you know, I still have people tagging FBI, come get your girl on my tweets, on my right. show promos. So just to watch your document documentary, Nick, and, and see what other folks went through. It's, it's like quite similar, you know, like obvi obviously I, I didn't thank God have to like shut down a business. You know, the FBI didn't come to my house. Yeah. Um, but there are similarities in that whatever community you were in, they were made to come after you just from being in D.C. on the 6th. Yeah. I mean, in my little experience, you know, I I, I went to North Carolina right after the 6th. Uh, I had a previously planned trip. And like, I, you know, I didn't really I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing on the news because it looked nothing like what had happened to me. And then during that week. Uh, at, at nine o'clock on a Saturday night, uh, I got a call from my agent and I'm like, I never hear from my agent. Why is my agent calling me? And he said, he, he calls me up and he says, well, did, did you go in the Capitol? I said, no. Why? He said, there's a casting director here that is spreading around a picture of you saying that Nick Searcy went into the Capitol. He's an insurrectionist. And I, I looked at the picture. I said, send me the picture. I said, look, I am way better looking than that guy. That's not me. And uh, I said, who was the casting director? And he told me, and it was an old friend of mine. It was somebody wow. I knew for 30 years. And she had my email address. You know, she, she could have called me and just said, is that you? But no, it's like they weaponize citizens against each other. That's their, that's their goal. And that's what has been the point of the conditioning that has proceeded through academia and media and all that stuff uh, feeding constantly this idea you know we have to protect you from those awful people that disagree with you because they're racist or they're white supremacist or whatever the label is and so you have this whole sector of the community and it's really large that are perfectly willing to act like soviet informants in the 30s you know turning in their neighbors for saying something mean about stalin Oh, yeah. I mean, it almost sounds like and you hear people will hear this and go, oh, they're exaggerating, yeah, at, yeah. you know, but when you and and you had a lot, you have a lot of big stars in this documentary, Nick, Ian Smith, who everyone knows, yeah. uh, owner of the Atellis gym out in Belmar, New Jersey, who has been fighting since like day one of the lockdowns, keeping his gym open, not charging memberships like a real voice. Uh, it, through all of this, Jack Posobiec's in it, Millie Weaver. You interview Aaron ba Babbitt, the husband of Ashley Babbitt, and like I was in tears watching him. Uh, just the passion he he still has for his country, the love he still has for his wife, and um, what was it like uh, sitting down with with Aaron Babbitt? You know it, it, what we really wanted to do when we started the movie. It's like we, you know, you, they. At, Ashley Babbitt has been vilified in the media. Oh, you know, absolutely. Paris. And so we wanted to, you know, show you who she really was and humanize her because the, uh, the media and everybody has been demonizing her for ever since the, it happened. And just to see Aaron have to kind of relive that for us and, and really tell us about exactly what he went through on the day. It's, it's heartbreaking and it's infuriating. It's no one, I could not I could not believe that this was the America that I was born into. You know, it's just so it is so antithetical to everything that I was taught that America was about what is happening to the injustices that are happening to these people. And you see the you know, the people that we interviewed, these are all people, people that have never been arrested for anything before in their lives. And they had their doors bro broken down like they were drug cartel members. And the only explanation for that is that the government is intentionally trying to terrorize private citizens that hold a different opinion than they do. 
Absolutely. It's to terrorize the citizens and it's to it's to terrorize the neighbors to be like, look yeah. at what look, you're you're basically publicly shamed in your neighborhood, in your community for having a different opinion and expressing it. And and everybody like take note because this is going to happen to you, too. And I just uh, I really can't wait for people to see this documentary because like and, and you're watching Aaron Babbitt, who's a tough guy. I don't know if he served in the military uh, as well, yeah. but I know Ashley did. Yeah, they both. So, did. so they're both veterans. You know, he's a tough guy, and he's breaking down, recounting like he basically watched his wife die on television. He, folks are like, he never got any kind of a call. Um, so that that's truly horrible, and um, you, the, you'll never see that in the mainstream media. You'll never see this guy, no, tell his side of the story. So. Uh, I'm sure he was grateful to be able to, to get that out with you. Yeah, it was hard for him. I mean, another couple of things that are in the movie that I haven't really seen anywhere else is that the fact that the break-in started before Trump finished his speech, that the break at about 1245 and Trump didn't shut up until like one o'clock. So the people that were listening to Trump speak couldn't have been the ones that were Breaking in, the, the speech wasn't being broadcast. They couldn't be listening to it any anywhere. He was supposed so, to start speaking at eleven. He didn't get on until closer to twelve. Right. So it's yeah, exactly. And and there are so many counts of people, you know, being made aware of break-ins before he was done speaking. So it's like any real fan of Trump's was going to be still listening or or not quite on their way yet. Yeah, still and, walking. And the other thing that, that really uh, struck me when we were making it is that, you know, the people that were listening to the speech couldn't have made it over there. And also what was going on in the in the Capitol building was what we wanted to happen. They were in there. The people that came to Washington that day wanted senators to, to object to the vote so that we could get another 10 days. Well, that's what was happening. Ted Cruz was doing it. Josh Howley was doing it. And somebody made the the point that I really hadn't thought of is like, why would we want to stop that? Right. The Trump voters did not want to stop that process. And what happened? They break in, they let everybody in and everybody claims it's the worst thing that ever happened. And they stopped the debate. They shut it down, said, let's certify the election. These people are terrorists. And we're the exact opposite of what we came to Washington was achieved by people breaking into the white house. And so that's why I concluded that most of that was not us. Yeah, most people were there to to shine a light on what was happening in the building, uh, to to bring attention to, you know, what was happening that day. Not to stop, not to stop what was going on. And that's one of the men in the movie, Coy Griffin. That's one of his charges: trying to disrupt a, an official proceeding. And Coy said that I wanted the official proceeding. That's not what I was there to do. <laughs> And let's see, who else did you have on here? Cordy Williams, Pastor Greg Locke, and Sharon Gold is a, and, kind of a big star in it. Yes, know? yeah. Oh, she was that sweet woman. Yeah. Uh, and just like hearing her recount, yeah, exactly. The the FBI used the same intimidation tactic to beat beat down. They broke through every, you know, kind of you hear the same story. FBI, they they say open up, they give you a minute to get to your door before they break it down. Yeah. Uh, uh, they were arrested. There were a couple of guys featured in the documentary who had like young girls, like 13 year old daughters. Each of them were put in handcuffs. Yeah. And why? Why do you handcuff a 13 year old girl? Unless the point is to, to terrorize, you know, there's no reason for it. At what point, Nick, did you realize I need to make a documentary of this day? I need to, you know, get as much information as I can together. Well, we, you know, we, we, we were there and we shot some footage, but we, we didn't go there with the intention of making a movie. We were just sort of like documenting the day. And then after all of it happened, we started to think about doing it. I, I kind of, my initial idea was like, I saw it as an, an attack on free speech. So I was going to make the movie, uh, you know, a little bit more of a general idea, general topic of the, the trouble with free speech was the original title. But the more we shot and the more we talked to people, it became apparent that the real heart of the movie is, is what's happening to these decent, honorable American citizens who went to Washington 
for no other reason than to make their voice heard. And so that's when it kind of began to evolve more into a movie about the victims of the FBI. And uh, for a while there, I wanted to call it the real housewives of the insurrection. (laughs) That's a great great title. That is a great title. (laughs) And it kind of fit because it really is, you know, they, they are taking real housewives and insisting that they are insurrectionists. Yeah. And I saw Enrique Tario is featured in the documentary and like people have mixed feelings on Enrique. I've heard some people say like over the months, like, Oh, great guy. He, he was, he was, he got a lot of attention. Oh, like, you know, how can anybody say the proud boys are a white supremacist group when, when the leader Enrique, Enrique Tario is Cuban, you know? So he got a lot of positive attention for that. And then I also had heard people say, Oh, he's a fed. He's compromised. What was your, you know, a, a what did you take away from, you know, working with him or interviewing him for the the doc? You know, I enjoyed talking to him. I, I, he showed us his whole facility, which basically amounts to a few offices where they make T-shirts, you know, and, and stuff. I mean, it, it didn't look like some crazed, uh, you know, violent group. And, uh, and I, you know, I have heard the same things. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, that, that kind of wasn't my area of interest. I I just sort of wanted to talk to him about, you know, how the Proud Boys have been treated as opposed to the BLM Antifa people have been treated and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. When you look at it, it's it's, it really is enough to make you nuts. Uh, All of 2020 was constant rioting, looting, uh, murders going on by BLM. Yeah. So much footage. And yet they treat the six like it was worse than all of that put together. It makes you so as someone who was there as you know, and there were a million, probably two million people there that day. As anyone who was there knows it was. And I got in trouble for saying this to Megan Kelly. I said it was a pretty chill day. And then, of course, they isolate that and put that in articles. Chrissy Mayer says January 6th was pretty chill. And then, of course, everyone who wasn't there, who all they saw is the very selective, what the media wants you to see, all the worst footage and photos. Uh, tell me how wrong. It's like I was there. Like my experience of it was that it was pretty chill. There was people. There were people praying. There was a lot of singing. There were a lot of families and kids and dogs in costumes. You know, I have so many pictures still in my phone of like dogs in like Trump hats and shirts. Yeah, um, it was it was very it was more peaceful than the the given day uh, in BLM Antifa for 2020. Yeah, and that's what I saw too. And and you know, I even saw I was in the back of the Capitol between the Capitol building and the Supreme Court, and they had these barricades set up back there, and everybody was standing behind the barricades. And then once in a while, somebody would go up to the front dressed all in black and start raising hell at the police and yelling at them and screaming at them. And everybody around me would start going, Hey, that's not us. We don't do that. That's not MAGA. That's not us, you know? And that went on for a while. And then I saw the police remove the barricades and motion people in. And that's when they went up on the steps and, you know, they just were on the steps singing. Most of the time they were singing, we're not going to take it because they were, there was a lady there carrying around a, a jam box playing that on a loop. And it, it, I, I took a lot of pictures and a lot of footage that day, but then after what happened, I didn't put any of them up. Same. I, I was yeah. afraid that like, me too. not not for me, but like they were arresting people that they just right. saw pictures, you know? So I didn't want to mm-hmm. put any pictures up that might incriminate somebody behind me or, or make them a target of the FBI. Right. Because people have been losing their jobs just for being there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the scariest thing. I think that's the point. They, they, they want to intimidate and terrorize. And that's why they're lying about it. That's why they, they only show you the violent parts. You know, they, there's no news program that ever said that it was a mostly peaceful crowd. There were two million people there. Of course it was mostly peaceful or we'd all be dead. You, know? you would think like, you know, that the average mainstream media news crew could have got could have got there by like what 9 a.m 10 a.m there there should have been day-long massive coverage of this of this event and you know i wasn't home watching the tv that day and but that was a very interesting point that 
that came up in your documentary, like they they were not covering this event. They they kind of waited to show just the most incriminating footage that would make anyone who was there look in the worst possible light. Yeah, they didn't cover the major part of the event because that's not the story they wanted to tell. And the fact that they weren't there on one of the biggest rallies of the year, on one of the biggest days of the year, that's kind of conspiracy theory stuff to me. It's like, okay, if they weren't there, then they knew what they wanted to happen and they were only going to show that. Yeah, it's it's hard to call it conspiracy theory when there's just so much pointing to, uh, you know, nefarious involvement here, you know, yeah. that, and you do do a really good job in the documentary of of illuminating that, you know, showing different because I, I saw too I saw Antifa there. I saw people like not dressed like patriots. And then you show footage of people changing behind a bush and then they get, you know. So someone that's shooting them talks to them and they and they're very aggressive and they're very yeah. hostile and it's like if, if you are just changing because you yeah. got something on you you wouldn't be angry and defensive like that you'd be like oh yeah it's cold i'm throwing on another sweatshirt or whatever yeah so, well yeah i was joking with somebody you can almost tell who's the who's you know on the right side and on the wrong side just by whether or not they're wearing a mask <laughs> <laughs> yes oh yeah <laughs> We're conservatives. We we want to kill grandma. We don't care about masks. Of course. Yeah. We love oxygen. 